Most of our calls are for pretty run-of-the-mill things like wasp nests in attics or raccoons living in the walls. That being said, Orion is considered a specialty pest control provider due to the services we offer for atypical or unrecognized pests. Those terms may seem vague at the moment, but I promise they'll make more sense in a second. A general rule of thumb is that if you think you are dealing with an unidentified animal is that salt repels most things. Not everything, but most things. Ground up white eggshells can be used as well, if you're environmentally cautious. I try to use them when I can, but salt is more readily available. Administering a line of salt to doors and windows, especially windows facing the west, is normally the first course of action we recommend to clients who are concerned about potential infestations from the unknown sorts of critters. However, if you believe there is an infestation already taking place, it's also possible to use the salt to try to contain the pest until someone is able to remove it. With that being said, sometimes more aggressive action is necessary when dealing with an atypical pest. On that note, here's a little PSA from your friendly neighborhood pest control specialist. Avoid coming into contact with any deer, raw venison, or servine fecal matter for a while. I know that most people don't feel inclined to play with deer crap to begin with, but you would be amazed at the insane things I've seen grown adults do. And unfortunately, many of those insane things were indeed scat related. Anyways, we received a call from a client claiming her dog was attacked by a doe of all things. Typically. We don't have to deal with deer since they tend to avoid humans. Normally, that's the Department of Wildlife's area of authority. But something was clearly off about this one. Initially, I was thinking that it had chronic wasting disease, since one of the symptoms noted in affected animals is that they no longer become skittish around humans. The client was understandably frantic on the phone. It just came up and bit my dog, and now it's in my yard. It won't leave. I swear, it's waiting for us to come back out. CWD is essentially deer Alzheimer's. So attacks from infected deer are typically brought about by confusion on the poor dying animal's part. That prompted me to ask the client about how the deer looked. If it was emaciated, that would be a dead giveaway. She said that its stomach was bulging, like it was pregnant. It was apparently watching her and her frightened doggy through the window, drooling. The distended stomach gave me pause. That wasn't usual for CWD. Thankfully, it was a slow day, so I was able to get over there as soon as possible. Before I left, I called one of the guys from the Department of Wildlife, knowing they'd want to hear about it, especially if this was some sort of deer disease that could be going around. The officer said he and his partner would take a look, but they were going to arrive a little bit after me. No problem there. When possible, we live trap the pests that we are called out for. That being said, some of these unidentified animals can be extremely dangerous, which is why a firearm, a container of salt, and a knife with a silver blade are required to be on us on every call, even if it appears to be something harmless. Appearances can be deceiving. My boss learned that the hard way once. As such, the salted knife stood on my tool belt at all times. 
We do also have a tranquilizer gun for larger animals, which I thought would be useful for the deer. When I first got there, I didn't see the doe, so I circled around to the backyard, trank gun at the ready. An expansive looking swig set shaped like a castle stood a colorful fortress, the chains squeaking as they swayed in the wind. A few yards away, the deer snorted at me, its hoof stomping on the ground. The animal's fur was disheveled. Its ears were drawn back close to its head. Foamy strings of drool hung from the corners of its mouth. The white patch of fur on its neck slick from the excessive salvation. Whether it was CWD or something else, this deer was definitely sick. Best not to get near it. I shot it with the trank gun. It let out a small grunt of alarm, taking a few ungainly steps towards me. I stepped back, trying to keep my distance until the animal could be knocked out. It shuddered, mouth opened up like it was about to vomit. At first, I thought the pink thing in its mouth was the doe's tongue, but then more appeared. Long tendrils unfurled from its throat, stretching along the grass towards me, a loud crack echoing in my ears as the deer's jaw snapped. The deer's body convulsed violently, its bloated stomach rapidly shrinking as the abhorrent thing slithered out of its mouth. My stomach lurched at the sight. I let out an extremely professional sounding whimper as I booked it for the swing set. Something you should know about me is that I have a phobia of worms. Snakes, spiders, rats, no problem. But for some reason, worms make my skin crawl. The deer had fallen to the ground. The poor animal still alive and quaking as its body was dragged by the worms crawling out of its throat across the lawn, inching towards me. A low, pained noise came from the deer each time that it was jerked along. Once I'd pulled myself into the swing set tower, I took aim at the deer's head with my rifle and fired. Blood and gray matter splashed across the yard. The worms twitched, thrashing around like jump ropes wielding by particularly aggressive toddlers. I shrank back, grimacing, becoming slightly nauseous, when I looked a little too closely at where they had protruded at was left of the deer's opened mouth. I fired again. The worms jolted from the impact their thrashes becoming more lethargic as their host died. The ropey bodies slowed their convulsing down to mere twitches until they eventually were limp on the ground, fanned out in separate directions along the grass. I watched the worms warily, not convinced that they weren't going to suddenly start writhing again. Gingerly, I reached for the salt wondering if I should go down and pour it on the worms, make sure that they were actually dead. All I had to do was go down there, where they were. Worms roughly the length and width of a human intestines. Worms that appeared to have taken over the body of a deer. Screw me. With a deep breath, I reluctantly slid down the slide to get down from the tower. With how tall I am, I scooted only a tiny bit before the soles of my boots touched the ground. My jaw clenched in anticipation. I got to my feet quickly as one of the worms weakly squimmered, trying fruitlessly to get nearer to me. I was close enough to see now that it had a round, jawless mouth edged by rows upon rows of small, sharp teeth. Ugh. Resisting the urge to flinch away, I lifted the lid for the salt, then dumped it on the horrible creature. 
It began its thrashing anew and I jumped back, preparing to run back onto the swing set like the big hero that I am. But thankfully, the worm seemed to be in its death throes. After its last bout of writhing, its movements finally ceased. Oh, thank God. I repeated this procedure with the other ones until they were all immobile. By the time I was done, I was shaky, trying to regain my composure. I promise, I'm not this squeamish about most of the things we deal with. It's just worms that get to me. And even then, I still get it done. I waited until the wildlife guys showed up to knock on the client's door. Truthfully, my hands were still shaking a bit since my adrenaline was wearing off, so I kept them in my pockets. I didn't want her to get even more freaked out than she already was, especially with the news that I was about to give her. I informed her that the deer's body was being taken by the Department of Wildlife to run tests, advising her to take her dog to the vet to check for any signs that the worms may have infected it. Her face paled. Worms? Unfortunately, yes, I replied, resisting a shudder as I recalled their rows of teeth against my will. I don't know how these species of parasites spread, so just to be safe, have your dog checked. The Department of Wildlife is going to take over from here. They'll be able to give you more information once they've examined the deer a bit. Before I left, I discovered that the wildlife guys were just as disturbed by the worms as I was. One officer said that he had never seen anything like it. They planned to take the doe's body for testing and said that they'd let both the client and me know if they found anything out. Later that evening, I received a call from the Department of Wildlife. They wanted to know exactly what I did to kill the worms. I told them, growing concerned. The client's dog was being quarantined after the vet found strange readings in its blood work. That made my blood chill. The client and her family were also being advised to visit a doctor in case any of them also came into contact with any infected biological material. The wildlife officer advised me to do the same. They weren't sure if the worms could infect humans, but since it had potentially crossed the species barrier by infecting our client's dog, they recommended extreme caution. I didn't think I came into contact with the worms, but I knew better than to mess around with things like this. Even though my doctor assured me in my initial assessment that everything seemed normal, I was convinced that any minor ting in my blood was a worm squirming around in my guts while I waited for my test results. In the end, everything came back normal. Good. I don't think I am emotionally or physiologically equipped to deal with massive worms growing inside of me. Unfortunately, the dog wasn't so lucky. It's not dead, don't worry. It just had to deal with numerous medications until the vets found one that was effective. Thankfully, it's alive and back to its inevitable life as a spoiled labradoodle. Though I guess the poor thing is more skittish than it used to be. Can't say I blame it. It was good to know this parasite is treatable as long as it's caught early enough. Granted, it's not clear how long the window is open for. Hours? Days? Weeks? According to the officer I spoke to, it was difficult to tell how long the doe was infected for. Meanwhile, the dog had only been bitten a few hours prior to needing aggressive anti-worm treatment. They must spread and grow pretty fast. That gives me the impression that the treatment window must be pretty small. When I mentioned atypical organisms earlier, things like worms were what I meant. 
They're merely animals that haven't been identified yet. We get a lot of them around here. Not parasitic worms, thank God. I needed a career change if that was the case. I mean, odd critters in general. Not all of them are hostile, either. Like with any animal, most of the time it all depends on how you treat them. Take the housekeepers, for example. While I was still waiting to get my blood tests from the worm incident back, I had a call from a client that started with, Hey, I called the police, but they told me to talk to you for some reason. Someone has been breaking into my house and cleaning up. They haven't taken anything, which is weird. I don't know what some rat catchers would know about that. I rolled my eyes. We don't have any shortage of uppity suburban pricks like this one who thinks that their silly little office jobs make them superior to everyone else. Some rat catchers. Despite my irritation, when I spoke, I was professional. Have you or anyone else experienced any sensations like being pinched in the middle of the night? What kind of question is... He started to snap, but I guess his brain must have turned on because his tone suddenly changed. Actually, yes. What does that have to do with the thing in my house? I ignored his question. Have you found any broken glassware? Uh, yes. How did you know that? Sounds like what you have is what we call a housekeeper. They tend to get a little feisty if their work isn't appreciated. So if you leave out something to clean before you go to bed at night, the problem should stop. The client adopted his snippy attitude again. Is that supposed to be a joke? No, sir. I'm completely serious. If you leave the housekeeper the offering like I told you, it'll continue to clean your home without causing any more issues for you and your family. Can I speak to someone who actually knows what they're talking about? I was struggling to think of a reply that wasn't riddled with cuss words when a pale hand appeared in my face. When did the boss get in, and why did he look so awful? Was he sick? The boss flatly said, He wants to speak to the manager, doesn't he? Without a word, I handed him the phone. As the boss politely ripped the client a new one, I scanned him. He was always a pale guy to begin with, being Scandinavian, but he was even more pasty than usual. The permanent darker circles under his eyes even more pronounced. Another thing that stood out was that he had a bandana tied around his neck. An odd fashion choice for him. His arms were covered by the navy blue company jacket we all wore, so I couldn't check what I truly needed to see. The client ended up hanging up on the boss. He shook his head, grumbling as he sat the phone back in its cradle. Be prepared for this a-hole to call back in a few days. I followed him into his office. Victor, is everything okay? The boss didn't look at me as he said. I'm as great as I usually am. That wasn't a good answer. I was about to press the issue when he muttered, I'm not using again, don't worry about it, alright? Reluctantly, I nodded, then went back to my desk. I've known Victor for years. He'd open up when he was ready. Sure enough, the dickhead did end up calling back three days later. Wouldn't you know it, he didn't follow our advice. Now the housekeeper was angry and somehow that was our fault? Customer service, everybody. I dragged our new hire, Reyna, along with this one to give her some experience. This was her first time seeing what happens when housekeepers are mistreated. I just prayed that it hadn't transformed. In case it hadn't, I took a container of fresh cream, hoping that a late offering would be enough to calm it. The client and his wife were cowering in a hotel, 
leaving the house entirely to us by giving us permission to use their hidden spare key. When we got inside, the place was wrecked. Broken glass littered the carpet and kitchen tiles. Cabinets were left wide open, emptied during the housekeeper's tirade. The white couch looked as if it had been clawed. Family photos were ripped up on the floor. I told Raina to keep her a container of salt handy. Wide-eyed, heads swiveling to take in the state of the house, she obliged. It hadn't followed the family, which hopefully means that it hadn't transformed yet, I informed her. So what does that mean? She asked. That means it can still be reasoned with. I found a bowl that hadn't been smashed and poured the cream into it. I loudly announced that it was a gift for the housekeeper. Transformed housekeepers will still accept cream. They just try to pull your ears off afterwards. Anxiously, I awaited to see what would come out. The floor above me creaked. Raina noticeably stiffened, looking at me for guidance, trying to emulate my body language. One thing I could provide myself on is that I'm decent at pretending to be more calm than I actually am in circumstances like this. Worm incident aside. The footsteps descended the stairs, revealing the client's agitated house guest. The bipedal, humanoid creature couldn't have been much taller than two feet. Neatly combed, coarse brown hair covered its wrinkled body. Its brow was furrowed in a scowl, its lip curled in distaste as it showed off crooked small teeth. Where it would have made sense for a noise to be was only a bony hole in its place. In summary, it hadn't transformed yet. Thank God. Disgruntled, the housekeeper stomped over to the bowl of cream, clutching it with both hands and downing it in two gulps. The entire time, Reyna watched with wide-eyed fascination. Once it was done, the housekeeper glared down at the table. It grumbled, You got any Baileys, girl? I do not, I replied. Shame. You'd be needing Baileys too if you had to deal with these frickin' people. Not wanting it to get angrier, I poured it some more cream. This time, it sipped gently as it was offered, seeming to settle down some. When dealing with the housekeeper, it is important to always be polite. As such, I courteously asked the housekeeper if I could be excused for a brief moment to talk to Reyna. He gruffly agreed. I whispered to her. Stop staring at him. He considers that rude. Instantly, Reyna looked away from him. I continued. If you have to speak with the housekeeper, make sure you act like you're dealing with royalty. No smart mouthing. And no matter what, do not smile or laugh in its presence. Don't tell it your name and don't ask for his. Understood? She furled her brow at me, but didn't question me as she did what she was told, coming over to join us at the kitchen table. When I rejoined the housekeeper, I said mildly, Your hosts have been ungracious. The housekeeper snorted. No need the sugar-coated girl. Frickin' ill-mannered, snot-nosed, Labrador-looking jack-offs is what I'd reckon they are. I nodded. He wasn't wrong. Reyna followed my lead, did the same. All I ask for is a damn bowl of cream at the end of a long day's work. But these people wouldn't know a good day's work if it bit them on the arse. They're all frickin' wastes of air, I reckon. It carried on ranting and raving like that between sips of cream. Silently, I let it, making sure to keep my eye contact brief enough to avoid staring, 
but long enough that the housekeeper would know that I was properly paying attention to our one-sided conversation. The housekeeper's vocal rampaging continued. They couldn't even be bothered to get rid of me themselves. They sent two little girls to go on and do it for them. Maybe I'll stay just to spite them. Break some more of their precious china. Keeping my tone gentle, the same voice I use for young children and argumentative clients, I tried to de-escalate things. But you're such a dedicated worker. Your talents are wasted on people like this. You deserve to be recognized for your efforts. The housekeeper sipped his cream thoughtfully. You speak truths, girl. Truths they are. I waited patiently for him to finish his bowl of cream. Reina's eyes and mouth were tight with anxiety as the room quieted with the exception of the housekeeper gulping down his drink. Finally, he set the bowl down and declared, I'll be seeking elsewhere. I'll seek the worthy. Internally, I breathed a sigh of relief. We wouldn't have to deal with a transformed housekeeper today. The two idiots that pissed it off won't go missing, not like the others who we couldn't get to in time. The client may be a prick, but I don't wish that upon him. I wouldn't wish that upon anyone. Before we left, I had Reyna help me line out the house's entryways with salt. While I doubted the housekeeper would come back, I didn't want to leave it to chance. So, do you think our client was grateful? Take a guess. For whatever reason, the idiot thought we had cleaned his house for him after we got rid of the housekeeper. He and Victor got into it over the phone, and the client threatened to sue for... something. Frickin' turd. Should have just let the housekeeper destroy the place. I chose these two cases for a few reasons. This first being that I wanted everyone to be aware of the deer parasites. Please, be careful out there. The second reason is that Orion operates in only a few counties in Pennsylvania and Ohio. While we can't help everyone, we could at least arm you with all the information so that you don't get in a bad situation with unidentified animals. Just remember, when in doubt, salt. And if you awaken and find that your house is now suddenly spotless, be gracious. Do better than the idiot mentioned earlier. Part 2 it seems that a lot of people are curious about the housekeepers, so I'm going to get into them a little bit more. This may be disappointing to those who want to welcome a housekeeper into their homes, but there is no way to predict how or why they pick certain places to inhabit. They tend to gravitate towards houses, barns, and apartments. Though for whatever reason, they also like shoemakers, Hypothetically, you could tempt a housekeeper by leaving a bowl of cream on your doorstep at night, but that could attract any of the neighbors of the hills, some of which you'd really don't want to mess with. I wouldn't risk it, no matter how much I hate doing dishes. In the case that someone reading this suddenly finds themselves with an unexpected hairy house guest, I'll give you a brief overview on how to care for a housekeeper. I gave suggestions in the comments of my previous post, but I think it would be best to repeat them here for all to hear. Housekeepers are only active at night. The first signs of a housekeeper infestation are that you may wake up in the morning to find that your entire home is spotless. Nice, right? For the most part, as long as you leave them some cream and maybe the occasional snack cake before you go to bed at night, they're not terrible roommates. As far as the cream goes, they accept heavy whipping cream, half and half, full fat cow's milk and whipped cream. 
However, it should be noted that if the housekeeper thinks that you're too lazy, or they just plain get annoyed at you snoring at night, you may be awoken by a pinch on the bottom of your foot in the middle of the night. They're finicky little guys that are prone to mischief. So that's how you keep a housekeeper happy. Not too difficult, right? Hell, I know a lot of people who've had housekeepers helping their families for generations. That's the best case scenario. Now, let's look at the factors that could cause a housekeeper to transform. There's outright refusing to reward them for their work. Honestly, that's fair. If I cleaned someone's entire house, and they couldn't even be bothered to give me a cool, tasty drink afterwards, I'd be a bit miffed myself. Another way they can transform will be covered when I discuss this next atypical case. The first time that I encountered a transformed housekeeper was during my second week at Orion Pest Control, which was roughly three years ago. While that wasn't my first time encountering the unknown in my lifetime, it was my first atypical case while employed there. At that point, it was just the boss and I working at Orion. After spending the morning dealing with an especially nasty wasp infestation in an old warehouse I got stung four times, we got another call. Victor put the phone on loudspeakers so that I could hear what I was in for. The client was terrified, telling her story through tears. While she was napping, she had awakened to a cold hand clutching her cheek. However, when she opened her eyes, no one was there. That's when something she couldn't see grabbed her ankles and ripped her from her bed, tossing her against the wall as if she weighed nothing. Do you have any salt at home, miss? Victor had asked her, not phased by this at all. I, on the other hand, was equal parts excited and anxious to see what awaited us in this poor woman's apartment. She shakingly told us that she did. He told her to draw a circle of salt around herself. It would keep the transformed housekeeper from getting close to her again until we could get there. During the drive, Victor broke the silence by saying, You were in the military, you said. He knew that when he hired me. Even so, I confirmed. Yeah, that's right. You remember your training well? I do. Good, you'll need it. When we arrived at the client's address, we heard her scream. It was the kind of marrow-chilling shriek that haunts your nightmares. A desperate, animalistic sound you never want to hear another human being make. The boss hurriedly tried the front door, found that it was locked, then promptly kicked it down. The client was cowering on the ground in a ball. A headless stout body covered in disheveled gray hair loomed over her, arms raised as it reached for her. Its skin was wrinkled and loose, as if the body had belonged to a short, hairy old man. The only thing that separated the client from her torturer was the circle of salt. There was a shrill laughter in the corner of the room. The housekeeper's head. It was sitting on the table like a macabre centerpiece, its red eyes gleaming like twin flames as it cackled with glee. As the boss marched towards the body, he commanded me to get the head out of the house. Feeling the warmth of the adrenaline creeping up my spine, I ran for the housekeeper's detached head. As I raced past the sofa, the furniture began to move on its own. My body reacted before my brain did, and I skidded to a stop on the wooden floor just as the sofa slammed into the wall next to me. I could hear a struggle behind me as Victor dealt with the housekeeper's body. The lights flickered maddeningly, making it difficult to see as I crossed the room. A vase threw off of the shelf right next to my face as if thrown. Shielding my head with my arms, I ducked, broken glass falling into my hair as the vase smashed above me. The head leered at me as my hands covered each of its pointed ears. I couldn't help but notice that its teeth looked sharper than a typical housekeeper's. 
I tucked it under my arm like a football as I turned to make a break for the door. A tornado of broken glass stood between me and the exit. I covered my eyes with my forearm, putting my head down. I almost dropped the housekeeper's head, catching it by the hair just before it could slip out of my grasp, which it did not like. It had a lot of colorful things to say about me, but I was preoccupied as a shard of glass embedded itself into the back of my hand, another grazing the top of my left ear. Gritting my teeth against the pain, I kept going. Pieces hit my work jacket, but couldn't get caught in the thick material. I was close. A shard stabbed me in the back of the thigh. Gritting my teeth against the pain, I somehow kept my balance and my grip on the housekeeper's hair, limping towards the door as warmth trickled down the back of my right leg. Once I had gotten to the threshold, I swung my arm and lobbed the housekeeper's head like I was pitching a baseball underhanded. As it soared through the air, it loudly swore at me one last time, its red eyes glaring at me as it landed rolling to a stop. Footsteps behind me. I quickly backed away just as Victor wrestled the housekeeper's body across the threshold, sending it sprawling with a kick to its hairy, wrinkled chest. Not wasting any time, Victor drew a line of salt in the doorway. The moment the threshold was covered, the lights stopped flickering. All the glass flying around the room dropped noisily to the ground. I watched with widened eyes as the housekeeper's body ambled over to its head, delicately picking it up, wiped some dirt off of its cheek, then set it back on top of its neck. The housekeeper gave me one last toothly grin before it departed, whistling a tune only it knew. Warily, I gazed after it, expecting it to come back at any moment to finish what it had started. It didn't. Meanwhile, the client was in the throes of a full-scale panic attack, crying against Victor's chest. He looked like he would rather be anywhere else as he uncomfortably patted her shoulder, trying not to bleed on her. Victor hadn't been spared by the broken glass the housekeeper had hocus-pocus at us. He silently grimaced as he pulled a piece out of his cheek. The glass had just barely missed his eye. His hands had numerous shallow, bloody lines across the backs of them. It's a good thing our company jackets are so thick. It could have gone way worse for us. I think the worst injury either of us had gotten that day was in the back of my thigh, but thankfully, it only needed a few stitches. Once the client had calmed down enough to speak, she admitted the grave mistake she had made with the housekeeper. She had given it a name. It was just a cutesy little nickname that I wouldn't dare repeat here. Using it will draw the transformed housekeeper back. The client had meant it to be enduring, but clearly the housekeeper didn't see things the same way. One thing to remember with housekeepers and with the night neighbors of the hills is that names have power. Asking for their names is akin to asking for their subseverance. Likewise, they interpret the provision of a name, even a nickname, as the attempt to take power over them. In turn, if you give one of the neighbors your name, they'll own you. On my drive to work, I pass by a picturesque hawthorn tree that stands alone at the top of the hill. During spring, white blossoms bloom, showering the hill in a blanket of pale petals. Just looking at it, you could tell that it's been there longer than Pennsylvania had been a state. It stands proudly enough that you could be assured that it'll still be on that hill long after most of us had left this mortal coil. And then two stupid kids carved their names into it. One of them ended up calling us, his voice quaking in terror. I don't know if you could help me, but I've been hearing laughing everywhere I go. In my head? They're in my head. Can you get it out? The hardness in the boss's voice surprised me. What did you do? I tried to whisper to him. Victor. 
He silenced me by raising one finger. The neighbors don't come after people who don't do nothing. What did you do? When the boy tearfully admitted to carving him and his girlfriend's name into the hawthorn tree between sobs, Victor sighed deeply, blood draining from his face as he said, We can't help you. I'm sorry. My blood ran cold. He couldn't be serious. This was a kid. He couldn't have been older than 21. What? I hissed in disbelief. Victor gave me a warning look, silently telling me to shut my mouth. That's when the music started. It was coming from the other end of the line. A stringed instrument playing softly. Was that a banjo? Could banjo sounds be like that? So memorizing? My hair stood up on my neck and arms as the melody continued. Victor also noticeably stiffened. The kid's voice changed, the fear suddenly gone. It was now dreamy and wistful as he breathed. What? Yes, I will. I will. The line went dead. Back then, I didn't understand at first. I didn't have the knowledge that I do now. I screamed at Victor, demanded to know why we were sitting by as something had happened to that kid. To Victor's credit, he remained calm and patient as he explained. That boy was dead the moment he touched that tree. We can't do anything for him. So we're just going to, what, let him die? I argued. If we interfere, we'll join him. Victor muttered as if he was concerned that someone would overhear. That made my argument stop. With another heavy sigh, Victor continued. One thing you need to understand if you're going to work here is that we're not heroes. We're pest control specialists. That's it. He pointed at the phone. That music you heard? Housekeepers are one thing. But that is something way more out of our league. That is something that will turn you inside out for looking at it the wrong way. That is something that used to be a god, and it hasn't forgotten it. As he spoke, I stared at the phone as the music played on a loop in the back of my mind, equally as haunting as it was enchanting. When I tried to sleep that night, I kept hearing it. I think that the neighbor who wanted to find the boy had intended that when it interrupted our phone call. It was a warning. A reminder to Orion to know our place. On the morning after the boy was taken, I saw what happened to him on my way to work. I wish I hadn't. I should have just kept driving, spared myself some more sleepless nights. But when I saw the blossoms strained red and pink, I felt my heart drop. I tipped off the sheriff as I navigated the car to the side of the road, snatching my tool belt off at the passenger seat before I walked the rest of the way towards the Hawthorne. If I was going to be stupid enough to investigate, I was at least going to be armed. When I had reached the tree, I discovered that the neighbors didn't just come after the boy. They came for the girl whose name was carved into the bark, too. The Hawthorne looked like a grotesque mockery of a Christmas tree. Intestines were woven along the branches like garland. The girl's head hung from a low branch, her dark hair wrapped in a neat knot around the tree's limb. Her face was stuck permanently in what appeared, disturbingly enough, to be euphoria. The boy's head was impaled at the end of another branch, wearing a similar expression of off-putting bliss. Both of their beheaded bodies lay like discarded broken dolls on opposite sides of the hill. Their torsos opened from groin to throat. Their hearts were placed next to each other on the base of the tree, right under where they had written their names. What's strange is that when this moment haunts my dreams, I don't see their bodies, just the tree with its reddened petals. 
We've never figured out which of the neighbors was responsible. Not that it would matter, since there's nothing we could do about it. To this day, thankfully, we haven't received any other calls about hypnotic music or laughter echoing in someone's mind. Probably because after that incident, nobody dares to go near that Hawthorne. It has since earned the macabre nickname, The Lover's Tree. After that phone call, I learned a couple of hard lessons. The first being that we can't help everyone. Like the boss said, we're just pest control experts, not heroes. That being said, I still try when I can. I have to. The second lesson was that the neighbors are like the damn mafia in the sense that you don't want them knowing who you are. It's because of lesson two that I refuse to give the town mechanic my name. To be clear though, I don't know for sure if the mechanic is one of the neighbors, but there's something about him that's just a bit off. I'll admit that he's probably one of the most attractive men I had ever seen in my life. Normally good old boys aren't my type, especially when they're covered in motor oil more often than they aren't, but it's hard to deny that he's stunning. His eyes break the illusion though. They're too knowing, too confident. The eyes of someone much older than he appears. The eyes of someone who could see all of the darkest corners of your being with only one glance. I try not to look directly into them if I could help it. The worst part is that he's the only mechanic for miles. Unless we want to get charged through the nose to have some scam artist at the dealership at the next town over. He also gives Orion and its employees a good deal for being a small local business. Avoiding him isn't exactly an option, no matter how untrustworthy he is. This encounter happened just last week, on the third year anniversary of the young people being found at the Hawthorne Tree. Hey there, stranger. The mechanic always greets me with a boyish grin that would be charming if it weren't for those eyes. Despite my unease around him, I'm always polite. Manners are important to the neighbors. I would like an oil change, please, for the company truck. Still smiling, the mechanic informed me that it would be about an hour. Just as I had turned to go kill time, he casually said, so how's old Blue Eyes? He was looking kind of rough the last time I saw him. That's his nickname for Victor. Suffice to say that the boss hasn't shared his name with the mechanic either. We've advised Reyna to do the same. Swallowing back my discomfort, I replied, Oh, he's just a bit sick is all. Nothing major. The mechanic raised his eyebrows thoughtfully wiping some of the oil gunk that had gotten on his forearm. Huh. Hope he hasn't fallen back into bad habits. He hasn't. I cut myself off. How did he know about Victor's past? He shrugged and said mildly, Not trying to pry. Just saw the marks on his arm is all. I nodded. Yeah, that's what it was. He saw the scars. That's what I was going to tell myself until I could get away from the mechanic anyway. After a beat, I replied, No, he's okay. He's been clean for going on four years now. Wait, why did I tell him that? Oh, he'd look into my eyes. I quickly diverted them, hoping he didn't see anything else in me. I don't know why he was suddenly curious about the boss, but I don't imagine that it was out of heartfelt concern. The mechanic's smile was deceptively friendly. Good for him. For what I could tell, that shit's hard to kick. I left before the mechanic could catch my eyes again. The mechanic called after me that he'd see me in an hour. It might have been my imagination, but I think he was taunting me. On the topic of the boss, Victor still hadn't told me what's up with him. 
I'm not the only one that's concerned. Raina stopped and looked at him the one day before, asking, So, are you like a vampire? Vitamin D deficiency, he replied flatly. She stared at him. Bruh. How do we know that the bandana isn't covering up bite marks? I challenged. That earned me a frosty glare. The boss already had an intimidating gaze to begin with, but with the harsh circles under his eyes and sickly complexion, he looked even more imposing than usual. Unfortunately for him, I've known him for so long that it doesn't have much effect on me. Go on, I urged him. Prove us wrong. Don't you have some work you could be doing? Any more worm infestations? He retorted. I rest my case. How do I know that you don't have worms? The wildlife guys were worried he could get in the people, you know. Nessa. His tone had the same threatening edge to it that my mother's used to have when I was about to get myself in trouble. Or, as in the case at Orion, being on worm duty the next time we got a call about it. Ugh. Fully prepared to face the wormy goodness that lied at my future, I decided it was more important to figure out what was going on with him. He's not just my boss, he's my friend. I'm worried about you, I said gently. In turn, he softened a bit. Don't. I'm not infected. I haven't fallen off the wagon. And I'm not fixing the drink either of you two's blood. That's all I could say. That made my ears perk up. All he could say? Before either Reyna or I could say another word, he retreated into his office. She and I exchanged a glance. With a skeptical furrow on her brow, Reyna whispered, I can't help but notice that he didn't confirm or deny being a vampire. We're going to be keeping an eye on the boss. If something or someone is keeping him from telling us about whatever is going on with him, we'll have to diagnose the issue ourselves. But before we could speculate about anything besides potential vampirism, the phone rang. Raccoons got into someone's attic. Back to business for now. In the meantime, if there are any other questions that you'd like to know about the housekeepers, feel free to ask. It's what I'm here for. When I'm not chasing bastard raccoons around someone's attic, of course.